Greetings, everyone. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to this special program, City Lights in conjunction with Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective present The Media and Us, Critical Media Literacy and Engaged Politics. Today's event is a day-long intensive workshop comprised of seven sessions aimed as a deep dive into critical media literacy. The program is based upon the book, The Media and Me, A Guide to Critical Media Literacy for Young People by Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective. It's published as a joint production of the Censored Press and Seven Stories Press. Our program will feature sessions chaired by members of Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective. With us today will be Nicholas Baham III, Ben Boyington, Allison Butler, Nolan Higdon, Kate Horgan, Mickey Huff, Andy Lee Roth, Rena Robinson, and Maria Cecilia Soto. At a time when extremist pundits and politicians alike promote fearful understandings of fake news and the negative impacts of social media, today's workshop aims to provide participants with the skills to resist the lures of sensational disinformation and omnipresent advertising. Drawing on decades of teaching experience, today's speakers will introduce key ideas necessary to develop a critical media literacy, urging us to look beneath the surface and beyond the screens in order to create an honest, accurate, more hopeful and inclusive future. With engaging hands-on exercises, we are given the tools to learn, to question, critique, and talk back to biased messaging, both subtle and overt, that the media feed us daily. Critical media literacy becomes a call to action, urging all of us to engage with the media landscape and become a well-informed citizenry. As is customary before each event, I'd like to acknowledge we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatisha Loni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I would like to take this moment to pay tribute to those who have come before us as stewards of the land with an offering of respect. Our first opening plenary session today is titled Looking Beneath the Surface. Members of Project Censored Media Revolution Collective will give an introduction to the day's proceedings and also talk about the book from which the event is based upon, The Media and Me. They will be discussing how they came to write the book and why critical media literacy should be a major focus of public pedagogy and curriculum for young people. Themes include freedom of expression, freedom of information, critical thinking, democratic government and civic engagement, media democracy, digital citizenship and civil and human rights all through a critical media literary lens. We'll be posting links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase copies of the book and other books by Project Censored, including the recently released Project Censored State of the Free Press, 2023, as well as a book that City Lights published together with Nolan Higdon and Mickey Huff titled United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America. For the sake of brevity and the fact that we have so many participants involved today, uh, we'll be posting everyone's bios on the City Lights website. I've also posted links in the chat so you can learn more about our participants. We'll be offering abbreviated introductions just so that the sessions can kind of move along smoothly. Each of these sessions will also be posted on YouTube where there is also closed caption capability for those who need it. Um, all the sessions will be made available. So we'll be posting those hopefully within a week or two. Also, because of the length and duration of the sessions, it may not be possible for everyone to experience the, you know, all of them at once. You know, it's just a really many hours. So uh, feel free to go to our YouTube page and look at them at your convenience. Today's event is intended to be interactive. So please feel free to utilize the chat function of your Zoom dashboard to communicate with the speakers and each other. As mentioned, we will also be posting links and information in the chat for you to peruse. So keep an eye on it. I'd like to welcome now Mickey Huff and Andy Lee Roth to get our first session started. Mickey Huff is the director of Project Censored and president of the Media Freedom Foundation. Andy Lee Roth is the associate director of Project Censored and co-editor of 13 editions of the Project Censored yearbook. Welcome to City Lights, everybody. I think I need to unmute you. <laughs> Let's see, hold on a sec here. Mickey, you need to. I am now unmuted. I am uncensored. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Peter. It's an honor and a delight to be here today uh, with City Lights and uh, with our our whole cohort, our Project Censored and Media Revolution Collective. So thanks, thanks so much, uh, Andy. And I would like to to thank everybody for being here today. And with that, I just wanted to turn things over to Allison Butler 
Uh, Allison Butler is going to lead our first introductory session today. So Allison, take it away. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks, City Lights. Uh, thanks to all of our, our cohort here um, of authors, as well as those of you who are here to learn more a little bit about this. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background, but then also provide an opportunity for all of us to kind of share what it is, like how we participated in this process. And certainly, uh, we would love to hear your questions, your comments, your concerns, anything we can do to support you uh, in the process of learning more about critical media literacy, learning more about Project Censored, um, maybe if you work in classrooms or work in libraries, learning more about how to bring this text to your work. Uh, this book was um, it, it, written by 10 people, which is um, could potentially be a recipe for disaster, but was actually really a recipe for um, a lot of fun uh, and for uh, really uh, walking our talk, right? A lot of the work that all of us do as individuals and certainly now collectively in media in critical media literacy is to try and look at things a little bit differently. Look at our world, look at our media, try and understand sort of where we are in history and where we are in our present uh, through a lens slightly differently from the kind of dominant legacy media narrative. Um, and so with that, we wanted to do that with our authorship as well. Uh, two things that we were tasked with in this book was one to try and represent a diversity of authorship that could speak to a diversity of readers' experiences. Uh, and so we are 10 very different people. Uh, this was also a book specifically for young people. It is, in fact, the only critical media literacy book written to young people. And so some of us, you might be able to see, although the lighting feels pretty good here today, have a bit more gray <laughs> than not gray. Uh, and so we have some uh, some young authors as part of our team as well to make sure that we weren't pandering because the second thing that we were tasked with was to not look down on our readers that uh, we were writing specifically to young people, but we weren't to be writing down to them with us being the all-knowing adult authority uh, that in fact we were asked to write up to look up to young people uh, and so we wanted to kind of check ourselves as well, right? If we're asking our readers to check and to think more carefully about their media usage, we also needed to check ourselves as well. Uh, we at no point in this book ever, or at no point in our work, tell young people or ourselves for that matter uh, to turn off or turn away from the media. Uh, instead, what we want to do is engage the media. Uh, we want to ask questions of the media. We want to learn more about the media. The media do teach us a great deal about the world in which we live. How can we learn that more thoroughly? How can we learn that in a more multidimensional way? So sometimes critical media literacy gets a reputation for being negative or angry or media bashers. And in fact, what we're really trying to do is take a little bit of a step away, to move a little bit away from what is truly the oxygen we breathe these days and say, hey, what does this look like as a multidimensional thing? Like, how can we move a little bit away from it in order to understand it a little bit more thoroughly? That to be critical is in no way, shape, or form meant to dislike. Uh, that to be critical is to ask questions. Uh, so what I'd like to do with that is to, um, and maybe I can go through my screen just for the sake of organization of where I'm seeing folks. Uh, for all of my companions in authorship to share a little bit about what they worked on so that you can all understand and see this book as, as its whole process. Um, and then also, I think we'd like to spend some time on how we see this book operating in the world and for whom. Um, so tr based on my screen, I'm going to actually uh, start with you, Kate, and ask you, um, and actually conveniently on my screen, ask you and then Maria to talk a little bit about your experiences <laughs> Um, as our as our resident whippersnappers on this on this uh, authorial group. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Allison. Yeah, I joined this project. I'm actually a student of Allison Butler's at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I originally joined this project to help with research, um, add, you know, a different 
as Allison said, perspective, um, as all of our authors are bringing to the table here. Um, specifically in the book, I helped write the chapter about representation, um, talking about who we see on screen, who we don't see on screen, um, elements of production. And uh, as Allison always says in our classes, the notion that the absence of data is data. So that's a big theme in that chapter. Um, yeah, that's where I kind of fit into the whole into the whole gathering, but it's been a real honor to work with everyone and I'm excited for the day and to explore all these topics together. Thanks, Kate. Maria, you're up next. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope that my mic is working fine. Nice to see everyone here and I'm so thankful to be part of this amazing team of writers to help bring this uh, to light, especially to the younger generation and people uh, such as myself and younger. Um, I wrote primarily in the representation chapter. My studies and research focuses in uh, linguistics and power dynamics. And so I wrote a little bit about linguistic profiling and discrimination and how um, that affects the media that we see and how it can affect our, our personal biases that we, we create as media consumers. And I'm excited to talk about it more in our breakout session. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Raina, I've got you up next. Hello, all. Uh, and yes, yet again, thank you all for being here, giving us your time and attention. Uh, my name is Raina Robinson. I am the CEO of a nonprofit center for urban excellence uh, that supports system involved youth. Uh, and I was brought in to the project, um, I believe, to provide that extremely niche lens um, um, for the book. And um, most of the work that I contributed was in the multiple literacy section, uh, more specifically around um, the metaverse and looking to the future of um, web 3.0 and, um, and really challenging youth to um, make great contributions as they um, engage with media. And thank you. Thanks so much, Raina. Ben, you're next on my screen here. Hi, right, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, and I'm Ben Boyington. I'm a high school media, uh, high school educator with a lot of focus in media education, um, critical media literacy. Uh, I think I'm the only high school person involved here, which is kind of exciting for me. Um, honored to have worked with these folks. It was uh, quite an adventure, as Allison uh, hinted at. Um, my primary role in the book uh, was to take lead on the uh, advertising, if you call it advertising and consumer culture chapter. Uh, which really led into this concept of the attention economy, which is really exciting and, and um, kind of obsessing over it right now. So, uh, but that was my main role and um, sort of also trying to sort of keep that high school lens alive um, and, and provide that. But then we had the fine young people came in and, and gave us more of that. So um, it's been great and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And uh, Nick. Nick, in your glorious sunset of a background there. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong, perhaps the wrong time of day for this background. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it nonetheless, so I hope you do too. Uh, so I am a uh, professor and chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies at California State University, East Bay. My contribution to this work was to deal with race, media, and technological redlining. And in specific, uh, I dealt with some of the implications of uh, the way that algorithms uh, differentiate us out and present sort of a segregated digital environment. And I deal with a couple of implications of that, particularly in the COVID-19 era, uh, but I will be speaking you, with you today in breakout session uh, room one about uh, how this is continuing to be perpetuated, particularly in the current Senate race between uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock and uh, Herschel Walker. So I'll, I'll speak to that a bit. And then I also provide some uh, background on how media, uh, really since the founding of our country, has consistently um, segregated out uh, voices of persons of color. Um, and even in the era of enslavement, how different newspapers dealt with uh, enslavement. In fact, even how Northern newspapers facilitated the, the trading and the capture of runaway uh, persons. So there's a, there's a long history here that actually precedes uh, technological and digital media 
but that is continuing to be played out within digital media. And that, that's my contribution. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, and then I think generally speaking, um, Andy and Mickey and I worked um, uh, in some some very particular areas, but also with this sort of broad overview of what we wanted the book to be like. So Andy and Mickey, I'd love to have you also talk a little bit about how we structured the book and some of the, the bigger areas that we really wanted to focus on within the text as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ahead. Thanks, Allison, and thanks to everyone who's uh, uh, here and joining in this day of um, dialogue about these crucial issues. Um, my name is Andy Roth, and I'm the Associate Director of Project Censored, so um, it was fairly natural that a lot of my energy on this book focused on issues of news and journalism and, and the swirl of um, dynamic and consequential issues that are captured in uh, you know, under the umbrella of news and journalism. Um, but my training is as a sociologist. And so I'm very um, pleased uh, at how the sections in the book that talk about media in general as an agent of socialization came together, right? This lifelong process of how we become who each of us are as individuals and community members and the role of media in that is obviously also another major topic that I think... Uh, both in this initial plenary session and during uh, probably across all the breakout suggests, uh, excuse me, all the breakout sessions today, one way or another, that theme of socialization will be uh, interwoven, I think, um, media as agents of socialization. Um, the other element that is, uh, I think, uh, powerful as a sociologist is that this book treats um, as Peter mentioned in the introduction, this book treats critical media literacy as part and parcel of a human rights perspective uh, on social life in general. And one of the points that we collectively make in the introductory chapter to this book, Media and Me, is that it's hard to imagine critical media literacy as an endeavor, as a liberatory project, uh, Without the foundations Without. of, of uh, human rights, uh, and in particular, uh, the freedom of expression and freedom of information as fundamental human rights. And so, uh, again, I think as a sociologist and as a co-author, a member of this illustrious team, um, those themes in this book are very dear to my heart and I think uh, important, important elements of what we have to say. Thanks, Andy. Mickey, anything you want to add to that, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, again, an honor to be here with City Lights with all of you. And it was really fantastic to work with so many great people on this book. Um, I'm the director of Project Censored, work with Andy Lee Roth. Um, just finished our my 14th edition, annual edition of the Censored book. Um, our approach to this is, is news literacy in particular. Um, I teach uh, at Diablo Valley College. I'm chair of journalism, co-chair of history. I teach social justice, critical thinking. Um, and I've taught other places, but my, my main uh, gig is at the community college in the San Francisco Bay Area. And my experience is that, you know, a lot of folks coming in, uh, I've been there 20 some years. And so what I've seen, of course, is more and more people coming in using more and more media. And of course, the other question of the flip side of that is more and more people being used by media, right? And so one of the things we wanted to do in this book, as you heard Allison say earlier, is speak up to young people, not, not down. And this is not a finger wagging book about technology being a bad thing. We wanted to try to give people, to give younger people some of the tools with, with, with which they can navigate our really complicated and convoluted uh, media landscape that they're basically swimming in. And for me, again, the main contributions that I have in, in the book were based on critical thinking, critical pedagogy, news literacy, I teach courses on propaganda, deconstruction, censorship. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, the, the group, the age group that we were you know, aiming for here, you know, teenagers basically, uh, teenagers have kind of this innate BS detector, right? <laughs> right? So we're, we're, we're not telling them anything that they don't already suspect. Uh, if anything, what we're trying to do is, is uh, give them sort of a broader framework 
where they can sort of channel that instinct and channel that innate ability to question authority in a way that yields questions that they can then build uh, more, not just you know for themselves, build better or more productive lives, but actually contribute more to community. And, and understand that the powerful role that media play, the sources behind media, particularly corporate media, major big tech corporations behind social, or I would say anti-social media platforms in many cases. And so those were my contributions uh, to the book. And later in the breakout sessions, I have a uh, plenary uh, midday on critical pedagogy, critical thinking. Uh, and again, we, we really believe strongly that young people are fully equipped and able to handle a lot of complicated ideas. And that's what we put in this book. And again, it was just an honor to work work on this with everybody and I'm really excited uh, for the day. So thanks everybody for being here. Thanks so much, Mickey. I also want to point out that I mentioned that we are, um, we are an authorship of 10, but a few of our uh, collaborators couldn't be with us today. Uh, so I just wanted to make a quick note that one of our co-authors, um, uh, Avram worked specifically, uh, their contribution was specifically on algorithmic literacy and particularly the impact on LGBTQ communities. Um, Nolan Higdon, who is going to be here in a little bit and will be at some of the breakout sessions throughout the day, but unfortunately wasn't able to get logged on right away, uh, has, is, is really... Um, very well known for his work in uh, in fake news and dismantling fake news and helping us as adults as well as helping young people have a good a solid idea of what uh, the many different definitions of fake news. And then if you get a chance to see the book and to look through it, you'll see that there are just these really incredible um, little picks throughout the book. It is, you know, we recognize that our audience is our youth are going to be youth readers um, and want to also provide to some element a visual way of understanding what we're talking about. So we worked with a great artist named Pete Glanting, um, who really sat with us as we talked about writing and um, uh, really put a lot of the written words to a visual element, which I think is going to just add such a huge and valuable component uh, to this text. As you've heard from some of us uh, at talk about our, our work and talk about our contributions, I think many of us might have shared a little bit of our background. And that goes back to the original point uh, of making sure that we had a diverse authorship. We do have university students with us. We have those who work in the nonprofit sector, high school educators, college educators, um, you know, all of our backgrounds contributed this as well. And it really, again, helps us walk our talk of saying that we are not, as Mickey pointed out, finger wagging, uh, that we are really trying to provide a space for young people to just have a better understanding. Um, and so the second big thing that, that I think we'd like to tackle in our opening time here and that will hopefully carry us through some of the breakout sessions today is how we see this book operating and for whom. Um, in many ways, I think we all see this book being a real practical resource. I'd like to see it get really worn out, right? I want to walk into somebody's classroom or not in a creepy way, walk into somebody's <laughs> living room and see this thing just be dog-eared with post-it notes or comments or whatever. This is really meant to be a working book. Um, we share a, a fair amount of theory, but we try not to be too overwhelmed by it, especially those of us who might come from a traditional, slightly more traditional academic background, and certainly those of us from communication backgrounds, why use five words when you can use 50, uh, but trying to really make this approachable for young readers, but also really practical, right? Throughout the book, we have call-out boxes uh, for folks to do some of their own activities or their own projects, um, to think through through what, how they might want to better understand their own experiences. Our last chapter uh, is entirely practical. It's all about what can you do? Um, and what you can do as a reader of this book might be as simple as reading the book, dip in and dip out of chapters. You're going to have learned something from it. Um, but also, what if you want to do more? Um, we don't want to have the first seven chapters of this book. It's an eight-chapter book. We don't want to have the first seven chapters be, here's all the things that's wrong. 
and then some sort of like awkward ending, like not at all. So we end the book with a resource guide um, and a really approachable resource guide so that young people can now that they have these critical thinking skills um, and these these ways of approaching the media, that they can make choices as to what they might want to do. And they can do this as they read it on their own. Or um, we would also really like to see this book be in classrooms or in libraries. So as Mickey's put in the chat, we have a companion study and resource guide that will be available to go along with the book uh, so that if it is being used in a more formal space, uh, we are all incredibly aware and incredibly sensitive to the fact that teachers have way too much to do. Um, they have too much work to do and we don't want to give them more work. What we want to do and one of the ways in which we collectively understand the work of critical media literacy is that it's to be integrated. It's to be infused with the work that's already being done. Uh, so we've got this resource guide by Micah Card, um, a really fabulous PhD student uh, in California and um, as a way so that we can provide teachers with a way to infuse it with what they're already doing uh, so that we're not adding more to it. And we're, we're working really hard to make this um, practically applicable. I'm gonna share, hot off the presses from my neck of the woods. Um, we have a critical media literacy course out of Oak Meadow, which is a distance learning school based in Vermont. And this course is using uh, the media and me as its primary text. So we're also looking to see this be in um, non-traditional classroom spaces as well. And I'd love to take a few moments for my um, my companions here to talk about sort of how they see the book operating and for whom. And then certainly op this, open this up for anybody in our audience here with any questions or comments or if there's anything we can do to support you in learning more about the book. Um, Andy, Mickey, do you want to get us started on that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of our themes for this plenary session, I think, ties in with the kind of the overall stance the book takes. The theme uh, for this session is looking beneath the surface. Um, and that's a metaphor that we use and unpack uh, in the book um, to talk about critical media literacy in hopefully a non kind of theoretical and very pragmatic way. Um, and so part of I was thinking about anticipating today, some of the ways that uh, critical media literacy as the kind of the topic and the focus of the book um, help us look beneath the surface, right? Um, and the metaphor we use in the book is of a of a traditional clock, um, like you might find on the wall of a classroom, or uh, if you wear a wristwatch that's not digital, uh, you have a clock with hands. Um, and everyone at some point in their lives has learned how to tell time, right? And you learn how when the big hand is here and the little hand is here, that means it's three o'clock. Um, and that's a, a skill that's quickly developed and then kind of forgotten as such. Right. We don't tend to think of telling time as a skill unless we're around a young person who's learning to tell time. And that's increasingly infrequent because now we have digital clocks. You don't need to learn how to tell time on an old fashioned clock. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, households have devices where you can say, you know, so and so tell me what time it is. And you just learn. But if you think about those old fashioned clocks, um, what makes them work is all beneath the surface of the clock's face. Right, the, we see the outer workings of the clock. The big hand is on the uh, 12 and the little hand is on the 11. It's 11 o'clock time to start the City Lights event. Um, but beneath the surface, there are all these gears and springs and wheels that aren't visible directly, but they're driving what's happening at the surface. And I think critical media literacy, as we describe in the book is a lot like looking beneath the surface of one of these old fashioned clocks and learning, uh, beginning to see beneath kind of uh, outer appearances, which can be superficial and distorted uh, and, and learning, well, what's driving, uh, what's driving what we see at the surface. Um, and that involves going beneath the surface. So you don't need to know how a clock works to tell time 
But if you know how a clock works, then when the clock starts running oddly, it's too slow, it's off, you might be able to do something about it. And I guess by the same token, probably the metaphor here reaches some of its limits. Um, with critical media literacy, you can look beneath the surface of whatever the media content is that's coming at you across your smart device, um, on the TV screen, et cetera. And you can start to think about critical media literacy gives you the tools to begin to understand, well, what are uh, the media equivalents of these gears and wheels and springs that drive the content? So to move away from metaphor, for instance, uh, I know later today we have a breakout session that includes a focus on advertising. And we'll probably end up talking some about how advertising block lists affect what we see online when we look at a website or when we are on a social media feed, right? So if you, these are, uh, these advertising block lists are invisible to users and yet they profoundly affect what appears or doesn't appear in a news feed that we might be following. So looking beneath the surface um, and this metaphor of the underlying kind of gears and mechanisms that shape content in profound, but typically taken for granted or invisible ways is I think a perspective that runs throughout, um, throughout the media and me. Thanks so much, Andy. Mickey, if you wanna to add to that. Yeah, just briefly. Uh, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Allison. Um, you know, just to give people a really quick overview of the book, I realize that a lot of people don't have a copy of it, as was mentioned in the in the chat. The book, the release date of the book, was pushed back to December twenty seven. Um, we have copies available. I put a link in the chat. Of course, City Lights also has copies available, and supporting your your uh, local independent bookstore is great. If you can't get it sooner, City Lights has copies now. Uh, so please feel free to get that. I'll also put information for contacts for us in the chat. So if anybody wants to contact us about it, ask questions, you'll certainly be able to do that. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to sort of just give you the quick outline of what the book does and then sort of a quick dovetail as to what Andy said and then pass it along. We begin with looking beneath the surface, as you just heard Andy describe. The book then begins chapter one, what are media? So we, we, we don't make assumptions. We just go right at the beginning. We ask that question, what are media? The book is designed to get students to tell us what, what, what do they think media is, right? What do they, how do they operate with it? We then right off the bat go into chapter two on critical thinking, nuts and bolts of critical thinking. Um, I know when we were doing the book, some folks said, well, chapter, chapter two is starting to look more like a like okay, some kind of a, uh, I don't know, technical writing or some, some other kind of <laughs> listing of things, right? Um, it's a little different than some of the other chapters because we go into detail about fallacies, cognitive biases, implicit biases, things right out of, the, uh, out of the gate that I think are really important for people to understand before they continue on to talk about, well, now how do we apply this to critical media literacy in particular? How do we apply it to the media ecosystem? Chapter four is on rep representation. Five is on multiple literacies. Six is on advertising and consumerism. So we certainly address the, the elephant in the room of capitalism in all of this. News and journalism is chapter seven. And then the last chapter, what do you want to do? That's the resource guide. And it's not, and of course, we're offering suggestions, but the way the book is framed is to get the students involved. What are you doing, right? Um, I'm also a uh, host and executive producer of the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio, KPFA out of Berkeley. We're on 50 stations. Um, and so I want to encourage uh, students to be the media. I, I don't want them to just be passive consumers of what they uh, see and hear. I want them to be motivated to use these kinds of technologies in ways that they can empower themselves and their communities and tell their stories. So a lot of the thread going through the book, too, is about storytelling. And just really quickly to dovetail on what Andy was saying, uh, we it, we do talk about um, you know what we think are are rather basic concepts, although most folks don't get them until they go to go off to college. But we we talk about Edward Bernays, you know, kind of concepts of propaganda about how uh, there are people behind the scenes of media production that you've never heard of that are pooling the wires that control the public mind. That's not a conspiracy theory. It's a business model, and it's a way in which the political economy of democracy tends to function. And of course, that you know, the other book into that is we introduce Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's propaganda model ideas. 
uh, to young people because they're able to understand how ownership and advertising and elite sourcing and ideology really kind of frame messaging. And so, again, I want to repeat this mantra. We're speaking up to, to young people. We're speaking with and ha offer a lot of space for feedback. And again, the way the book and the study guide are written, it's really driven to be student centered. And so we really hope that folks um, you know, see that and see the, the merit in that and the worth in that. As you saw, Allison, uh, with the Oak Meadow Guide, it's really heartening for us to see that there, there's, there's real interest in this subject. We hope you're also interested and we look forward to hearing, uh, hearing more from you throughout the day. So thanks for that opportunity. Allison? Yeah, thanks so much, Mickey. Um, I'm I'm keeping an eye on the time, and I think it's probably pretty clear right now that the group of us could just sort of keep on talking yeah. about this. Um, I do want to give folks uh, in attendance the opportunity to ask questions. If I'm not mistaken, I think you have to type them into the chat. I think we're set up so that everybody is muted. So if you've got a question or anything you'd like for us to address in this opening session, please type it in. Um, I'll I'll keep an eye on that and. And, and while you're thinking of that, I would also like to just sort of add to some of this holistic way of understanding the text is that we are not here to be as authors um, or as in, in our own research, etc. We're not here to be um, dictators or proselytizers, right? We we all have our belief systems. Obviously, we're human beings, right? We are we are subjective bodies. We are not in any way, shape, or form trying to say that we are anything other than subjective. But what we are trying to do is model how you can use evidence, um, how you can use critical thinking, uh, and how you can use um, uh, use the the media that we have around us to become uh, just more knowledgeable and maybe as Mickey talked a little bit about to become the media to be more knowledgeable in our own media production. Um, we recognize that the media aren't you know, we, no, we are not trying to abolish the media um, and we recognize that they're not going anywhere. And quite frankly, we wouldn't be able to be here with you or have done this work with each other without a certain amount of digital technology, right? We are around the United States. We did not have the opportunity, especially when we were working on this book, sort of, we were coming out of lockdown, but most of us were still pretty much in our homes. We wouldn't be able to have done this work um, or started this conversation were it not for digital technologies. Uh, so we recognize that as much as the media may take from us, they also give to us. And that's part of our work too, is understanding how just because this is the way the world is, doesn't necessarily mean it's the way the world ought to be. And how could we become more active um, citizens, right? That's that's a term that we use throughout. It's a little cumbersome at first, and then we kind of shorthand it, where we talk about our readers becoming critical media literacy citizens, which, you know, let's be honest, takes a long time to say. Uh, so what does it mean to be a critical citizen, right? And that, that this is about you, the audience member, you, the reader, uh, coming up with uh, using some of these tools to become more evidence-based in your own analysis, evidence-based in your own use, and potentially evidence-based in your own production, if that's where, if that's where you are in your media use. Uh, so we wanted to make it sort of a much more uh, democratized space. Mm -hmm. um, I see both Mickey and uh, and uh, Peter entering stuff into the chat. Thank you both so much for kind of keeping up on that. Uh, are there any questions or any comments from any of our participants? Like I said, we can keep talking, but we don't want to ignore maybe some of the stuff that you're particularly interested in or concerned about. Uh, so as you're thinking of them on that note, I would also love to, you know, have our authors also talk about their hopes um, or their plans for the book as well. Um, and again, my screen is now um, moved. Oh, let's do this. Let's get to Jackie's question first. I'm just going to read this out because I think the chat disappears in the recording and this would be just really awkward on YouTube. So knowing you are doing the work that is imperative to bring back a sense of autonomy among U.S. has soothed my fears. 
<laughs> and sparks my need to sometimes speak out. Oh, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> and Jackie writes, thank you. Uh, you have added greatly to my hope and my education just by this meeting. Thank you for your work and your genius. Please never give up. Jackie, thank you so much. That's really, really kind, particularly at the beginning of the day, which um, goodness knows where we'll be by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that actually, Jackie, one of the things in between the lines of your comment in the chat is this idea of hope, or not in between the lines, it's quite literally there in between the lines for many of us might be the fact that I think I speak for all of us and please correct me if I'm wrong that none of us are cynics um, we are all skeptics um, and we have a sort of health what we think of as a healthy skepticism but we're not cynical right to cynical to be cynical means that we dive deep into fear um, and that we don't have hope if we were to if we were to think of ourselves as cynical we wouldn't be here right we wouldn't be having this conversation chances are we probably wouldn't have written the book right i think of being cynical as as a sort of a full stop we're done but skepticism allows us to ask questions and to think about the way we might be able to do things differently um this is the way the world is now it doesn't mean it needs to be the way the world is going to be um so we we absolutely are going to keep going. Uh, Allison? Yeah. So Gina just asked a really yeah. great <clears throat> a really great question and this is right up your alley you and Nolan Higdon and of course Andy Roth has also done yeah. this. So just Could I just to... piggyback before turning yeah, to that next ahead. question? Yeah. Skepticism, but I would also add curiosity. Yeah, thank you Andy. I think we're driven by curiosity, which is which is related to skepticism but not Right there, there may be sieves, but they aren't identical sieves. Mm -hmm. The curiosity element, I think, is strong. Uh, I, 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 I mean, the young people I know have curiosity, um, and I think you know, working on this book, part of what was fun about it was it fed my hunger to learn more myself. Right, mm -hmm. working with nine different people, some of whom I work with all the time some of whom I've met for the first time in the course of this project, right? But that notion of curiosity, like how does this work? Like what happens if I hold this up and really look at it closely? Not just, not just like I'm flipping through my screen, you know, I'm flipping through to see, to get to the end of what my feed or the music's on in the background while I'm doing something else. But what happens for any media, media object, any media content we might want to, what happens if I hold it up and look at it closely as if I'm seeing it for a first time, right? And yeah. I think skepticism is a crucial element of that. And I think the kind of, of resources and skills that the book develops, but the, but the other driving thing for me is that spirit of curiosity. Yeah, okay, uh, so, more questions. So, so <laughs> thanks. Sp thanks. Sp sp speaking of, uh, of skepticism, Allison Butler, uh, Nolan Higdon isn't here right now, but we also have to have healthy skepticism toward media literacy movements and the corporate mainstreaming of media literacy movements. And recently, uh, NATO has gotten involved with media literacy organizations trying to tell us what is fake news or propaganda while they're simultaneously producing their own with the Atlantic Council and so forth. Allison Butler, perhaps you can uh, talk, talk to Gina's concerns. Yeah, so Gina's question in the chat, how is media literacy, parentheses, not critical media literacy, been appropriated by corporate media? So I'd like to start um, with just a really quick uh distinction of critical media literacy, the work that we all do, right? I mean, we've talked a little bit about it in terms of critical thinking or critical distance. Uh, it is also very much particularly about uh, explorations of power, right? Looking at the behind the scenes, um, the ownership, production, and distribution, getting really into that political economy um, of the media and understanding power. Um, somebody's microphone is is it my, i hope it's not mine somebody's microphone got a little bit wonky but i think we're okay now okay uh so to be critical to work in critical media literacy is to do a real dissection of power and that behind the scenes power that's sort of pulling back of the curtain and to that end those of us involved in critical media literacy see power in corporate media and so we stay away from kind of corporate media funding um not that they're banging down our doors to give us money, but under the argument that if the corporate media are 
supporting media literacy, then chances are they're not supporting much in the way of their own self-reflexivity, uh, their own way. Of, they're not inviting themselves to be looked at most closely. So I think, Gina, some of the differences, um, I think there's uh, there's several differences, um, but some of the ways in which media literacy has been appropriated by corporate media are by the corporate media themselves, um, as Mickey mentioned, NATO, um, the, and then this headline by um, our colleague and friend Nolan, the military industrial complex wants you to be more media illiterate. Uh, certainly post-2016 election, absolutely moving through COVID, many of the big corporations started developing and releasing for quote unquote free uh, media literacy curricula. Uh, Facebook has it, Verizon has it, Google has it, all sorts of folks have an, a media literacy curriculum that they offer for no money. So free of cost, uh, but not necessarily free of um, perspective. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the Google one because in particular, because I think there's a couple of things that can help us understand that distinction between media literacy, corporate media literacy and critical media literacy, specifically through the Google curriculum. So Google's curriculum is designed for early childhood, uh, young learners, and it's the gamification of uh, education, which I'm not entirely opposed to, except in this case, what you do is you play a series of video games that teach you different skills. And one of the skills, I, I played a game called um, being internet kind. I am now certified as somebody who is internet kind. Uh, and this game, it took me about an hour to figure out how to even start the game because I'm not a gamer by any stretch of the imagination. It's you go through a series of pathways where you, the character, these little triangle and circle shaped, square shaped characters um, are, are confronted by meme. Uh, mean people, uh, angry, lots of different things. And the way that you learn how to be kind is you throw nice things at them. So you throw hearts at them or you throw smiles at them, which got me a little confused because if I'm being kind, why am I throwing stuff at people or shapes? I guess I'm throwing stuff at shapes. And then as you get to the next level, I was pretty impressed with myself when I got to the next level, there's a bully it's this big character who's very angry and just really kind of as aggressive as one can be in, in a very simple game. And the way that you are kind is to put that bully behind bars. That got me a little bit concerned. I'm not saying that we shouldn't eradicate mean, but what does it mean? What, what is a, the symbolism there of the bars? And so this is the game that gets played. Now, all of this is what's happening on the screen. What's happening behind the scenes with the Google curriculum is that now, because it's designed specifically for early childhood, through permitting the child, either by their own accord or their parents or guardians, to play the game, Google now has access to their data. Uh, so officially, young people under the age of 18's data mining is protected. We know that those protections are extraordinarily weak um, and don't hold up very much. Uh, and in fact, this is how Google gets young people's data legally, because you or I or we or whoever signed up for this. And now that door is open for the child's data. Uh, Google has openly admitted in the past that it is worth their money to get fined for illegally accessing minors data because the amount that they make from that is incredibly rich. The other interesting thing about Google's curriculum is that at no point ever does it ever ask any questions about search. Now, it might be naive of me to think that they would self-interrogate about their own search engine, but what's even more interesting to me is that there's nothing even remotely about search at all. It's as if search is invisible, that we go online and we type in questions or we ask for information is is not something that is even needed to be. They don't even promote themselves. They don't need to promote themselves, but there's nothing even remotely questioning or 
looking at what it means to be on a computer or on a tablet or on a phone or whatever device and engage in this act of search, uh, which when we're talking about digitization is probably, I would think, pretty important. What does it mean that we have to some extent, the world, at least as it's configured by an algorithm, at our fingertips. So the this is where Kate mentioned earlier that some, some of the stuff that we talk about in my classes a lot is that the absence of data can be data. What happens when we're not asking questions about the, the very way in which we are encouraged to ask questions these days in a digital platform? Uh, so those are some of, those are the problems I think within specifically corporate like capital letter corporate media literacy curriculum we also have something uh maybe a slightly smaller scale possibly more insidious it's up to, to you to decide is when media literacy organizations are funded by corporations uh, that some of these big corporations will pay for media literacy conferences um, or pay for media lit research in media literacy uh, under the idea that, hey, we, we think that, that the people deserve to know more about this. But as any self-respecting grandchild over Thanksgiving knows, if grandma gives you cash money, you sit and talk with grandma. You don't take your cash and be like, peace out, grandma, thanks so much, right? It is so hard to bite the hand that feeds. Uh, and if the corporation is paying for your research, chances are your research should find them in a positive light. And if it doesn't, there's no reason for that corporation to ever let that research be released. Uh, so we have a way in which the corporation can stop that process of interrogation, stop that process of critical inquiry by truly holding the purse strings. Um, and I just want to take a look at, uh, as Mickey said, Nolan and I have written about this a little bit. I could kind of keep on keeping on. Um, but uh, uh, Robin, thank you for the comment. Criminalization is always the answer to all of our problems. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and then Jackie, again, thank you that that we are giving you hope. Um, and uh, but it. it I, I understand. Jackie writes here, this discussion gives me nightmares. You give me hope. That's what I experience with you in this world. Uh, I would say let's think about trying to flip those nightmares um, and think about how we can, how we can again, ask these questions um, and then start to share with, with each other. Something that I'm assuming is going to come up over the course of this day will be conversations about um, uh, conversations about social media, right? Social media are largely, uh, hugely important to, to our world these days. I think social media, in fact, can be profoundly antisocial uh, and can certainly keep us alone and in some ways isolated. And this conversation in general, even acknowledging that it's difficult, even acknowledging uh, that, that it can, as Jackie writes, give you nightmares. It's also about... Um, getting rid of some of that ice, chipping away at that isolation, chipping away at those silos, uh, chipping away at what keeps us alone, um, sort of in our little boxes. And our boxes might be very comfortable, right? There's no doubt about it. The algorithm, again, stuff we'll talk about throughout the day, can really keep us quite comfortable because we don't have to be confronted with material with which we disagree. Uh, but then we might find ourselves agreeing exclusively um, with ourselves, which means we're not in communication. Andy? Yeah, I mean, just picking up on what you said, Allison, about search, and search is a fundamental activity that we all do online. It's how you, you know, it's partly how we navigate online spaces. Um, one of the things that I've recommended that's really small and simple, it's not going to change the world, but it's a consciousness raising uh, 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 change. Let's not use Google as a verb. Right. Google has done so much to commodify people's information, to to take it without their permission and to make money from it. Um, let's not give them the status of a verb. You know, so we talk about, oh, I'll Google that. Um, like I, I'm trying to train myself not to do that, to say I'll search for that. Um, and I think part of that is important. It's not just like saying, oh, you say tissue paper instead of Kleenex. Right. Or I'm going to photocopy that instead of Xerox it. Um, I think there's more to it than that. I think it's it's reminding ourselves that there a 
even now there are alternatives to Google as the search engine that you use. It doesn't have to be the only thing. Um, there are alternatives that are much more respectful of our privacy as users of search functions, um, such as DuckDuckGo, for instance. Um, I have no affiliation. I don't have any connections. I would no way profit from that. But if you go and read what DuckDuckGo's pri uh, privacy policies are and then compare them to what you can glean about Google, there are some fundamental and meaningful differences there. Um, so thinking about search as this thing that uh, uh, almost all of us do on a daily basis and just thinking about how we talk about it and how we conceptualize it, that to me is part of that looking beneath the surface, right? Taking something that is normal, natural, taken for granted and holding it up and saying, well, wait, what does it mean when I use a corporate name to, to describe or identify or, or name this, this activity that isn't owned by that company and shouldn't be owned by that company? Uh, thanks, Eddie. I'm looking also at a question here. What is the chance that if a fascist government came into power that search results would be used to persecute people? Uh, I, you know what? I'm not sure if we have to wait uh, for a fascist government to come into power. One of the things that we've seen since the overturning of Roe versus Wade is the way that um, women's health choices have been monitored. Um, women who may use uh, apps to track their cycle, that is sending data. And if they are to miss a cycle, that could potentially raise a red flag. I don't think any woman has ever been so clockwork in her cycle that those dates might not change a little bit, but that is already something that is being monitored in particular areas. Um, women who might be looking online, who might be searching online uh, for healthcare providers, that sending data out there. Uh, so do I think it would probably be maybe scarier with a uh, fascist government and search being monitored even more closely? Sure. But I think that we have to see that to some extent it is it is happening already. And one way we can see it happening in real time is in uh, women's health care. Uh, I think we are coming uh, officially, we are done in about three minutes with this session. Um, so again, last minute, couple of questions, if at all possible. Uh, if you're interested to ask them now, you can certainly ask them throughout the day. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> um, and we've got a lot of stuff that we're really excited to share with you. And we hope that this book um, is going to be a valuable resource um, over over the course of time. Uh, Peter, Allison, I'm not sure. yeah, Allison, I, I put uh, at least I put my email contact in the the chat. If anybody, no one has to, but if anybody else wants to put an email for people in this session, if they want to contact us, you can feel free. And I just wanted to remind folks that uh, please feel please support your local bookstore. But right now, this book won't be out till the end of December. So right now, City Lights can be your your local bookstore. If it is, even if it isn't, it's local here. Um, you can order Media and Me at City Lights. Our, uh, we've, we've got them copies. And of course, we at Project Censored, the Censored <laughs> Press, we also have copies. So if you want copies before the book comes out, you can get it through City Lights Books, or you can order it straight from Project Censored. So, and again, feel free to contact us if you have any questions, comments, or if you'd like to get involved and figure out how to use this in your classroom. Uh, and to Andy's story about, hey, let's maybe try and think about changing our language a little bit why do we have to talk about googling stuff um, uh, I, there's a little there's a little story that i'll tell that hopefully will not take up too much time when jewel uh the e-cigarette the vaping company was getting started they had pretty two very clear marketing goals one of them was to attract young people uh because goodness knows from the 1950s tobacco advertisements, they knew that they weren't going to get people to change brands, but if they got them started young, they would be brand loyal. And so Google just 21st century capitalized on that 1950s advertising, but I, excuse me, Jewel, well, also Google. Um, so Jewel capitalized on that 1950s tobacco, ad, very successful tobacco advertising. But the other goal of Jewel's was that 
anybody, any product that anybody used, they used Juul as a verb. So even if we were using some other brand of vape, some other brand of e-cigarette, you would talk about Juuling as the action that you were doing, the way maybe we used to say smoking. Uh, and obviously, Juul has gotten themselves into a lot of trouble for other things, but that is free marketing. They didn't really have to pay for that, right? And we didn't really actually even have to buy any of their products to start using their terms. So, you know, to Andy's point about, hey, let's just talk about search. Like, let's sort of think about ways in which we can take, if we can take back some of the marketing and advertising that we are doing for these corporations, we can make maybe a tiny little bit of difference, um, just even in, in our own word choices. Uh, and with that, Peter, I see that we're at three o'clock. So I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, for any technical next steps um, and just say thank you, everybody. This has been a great start. I'm super excited to see folks in different um, in different configurations throughout the day uh, and to keep talking with everybody about this work. Well, thank you. And, and thanks, everyone. Such an honor to have such an esteemed group with us and Really greatly appreciate you all being here today. I uh, look forward to seeing you again in the next session. We posted links with which you can acquire, of course, Media and Me. Uh, if you folks who have not registered for other sessions, if you want to email me at peter at citylights.com, I'm happy to simply send you all of the links and you can pick and choose. We're also going to be posting things on YouTube. Um, so you'll be able to pretty much see, you know, all of the sessions and pick and choose and at your own leisure. Everything will be captioned as well. We do apologize. Our captioning is not working at the moment. But uh, if you go to the, you know, the recordings, you will be able to you know, have that experience. Uh, also want to remind you, our next session will be the first breakout room. It's called Representation, Access, and Power. It begins in about uh, 11 minutes. It's at uh, 1215 Pacific, 315 Eastern Time. We'll be joined by Rena Robinson, Nicholas Baham III, Kate Horgan, and Maria Cecilia Soto. So uh, we hope to see you there. Today's event is, of course, being brought to you by City Lights in conjunction with Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective. All events for City Lights are made possible by supports of the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into the future through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. Thank you again for joining us. See you again soon.